So I would like to welcome our guest Reem for the evening. Reem Abuhaya is a peace and security campaigner at MEDACT, raising awareness of and campaigning on issues related to the health impacts of war, armed conflict and nuclear weapons. She also leads MEDACT's work on the prevent um, duty in healthcare and has written on racialized policing and health. Reem has a background in campaigning against the arms trade, militarized occupations and immigration enforcement measures. So I would like to welcome Reem to our reading group. Thank you, Reem. Take it away. Um, hi, everyone. Really pleased to be here. And um, just apologies, apologies if my internet is a bit funny. It's been playing up all day. Um, yeah, so just to start, um, I work as the Peace and Security Campaigner for MEDACT, which is a global public health organization that mobilizes and, support, and supports health workers to campaign for transformative change on the root causes of health inequalities. MEDACT's an organization that sprung out of the medical peace movement after the devastating bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, and in the midst of the Cold War. And of course, today is the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, it formed out of a merger between the Medical Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons and the Medical Association for the Prevention of War in the early 1990s and began working not just on armed conflict and nuclear weapons, but also on issues related to migration, socioeconomic inequalities and climate change. So just, um, just to like introduce the topic a bit before we do go into the breakout groups. Um, I was really pleased when Sana said that CAT were planning a reading group session on coronavirus and the arms trade, because despite the very clear health and humanitarian impacts of war and armed conflict, little is spoken or known about how the two link a bit more substantively. Not only do health workers treat people affected by war, both in the war-torn country and in the country that those fleeing war and persecution migrate to, but they're also often at the front lines of armed violence. Despite legal protections under the Geneva Conventions, health workers and facilities are often targeted for attack due to treating people on all sides of the conflict, irrespective of their political ideology. In my blog post from Medat, which I um, recommended as reading, called Responding to Coronavirus, Intersections with War, Militarized Violence and the Arms Industry, I outline a few ways that health, and particularly health crises, such as the current coronavirus pandemic, relate to war and the arms trade. When we think of the health impacts of armed conflict and war, we often think of the immediate aftermath of instances of violence, the people who've died, the injured and their necessary treatment, and the destruction of homes and health facilities. And of course, health and emergency services must consider this immediate aftermath in order to prepare themselves for such events. However, in my blog, as you hopefully will have read, I focus on the legacy of armed conflict, war and military occupation, because the impacts long outlive their immediate effects. In all of the countries and regions that I discuss in this piece, Gaza, Yemen, Iraq and Syria, militarized violence and war have had long lasting devastating impacts on their economies and consequently on all public services. Even if health facilities remain intact throughout the duration of the conflict or war, if economies are destroyed, and often they are, people are forced to flee, industries are devastated, there are no longer the resources available to properly fund crucial public health infrastructure, including health and sanitation services. Often, international or bilateral trade sanctions are imposed during and after times of conflict, which again squeezes economies and creates difficulties in being able to access necessary goods and materials. And one example of that, um, one good example I think that many people will know of is the siege on Gaza. Um, so, and I, I write about that a bit in the piece as well. This is compounded by the political instability that precedes and follows armed conflict. It's often this erosion of infrastructure that leads to longer term public health crises in countries that have experienced armed conflict. So when it became clear that coronavirus was going to affect the entire world, when it was gonna become, go from being an epidemic to being a pandemic, there is a widespread fear that countries ravaged by war and armed conflict, many already facing health and economic crises would be hit particularly hard. As I mentioned in my blog, and as Kat is very aware of, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for an immediate global ceasefire in order to create corridors for aid and medical equipment to respond to coronavirus and to free up capacity for the in-country emergency and health services. For this reason, and 
it might have seemed a bit um, unrelated to the topic of the arms trade, but I'm going to talk about why it is in fact related. I included the reading in the reading list Dr. Neil Singh's article in The Guardian, Cholera and Coronavirus, Why We Must Not Repeat the Same Mistakes. In his piece, he reminds us that, and I quote, coronavirus is not the only pandemic the world faces. Before describing at length the persistence of cholera, a disease that has mostly been eradicated in the West, in poorer nations in the global south. Cholera is an infectious disease that causes severe dehydration that can and has proven fatal if left untreated. It's the result of a bacteria found in water and food, particularly found in overcrowded communities with poor sanitation and unsafe drinking water supplies. In his piece, Dr. Neil Singh wrote, empire shaped the history of cholera and it was the economic concerns of imperial powers that brought cholera to heel in the West. But if imperialism was crucial to providing the impetus to end cholera, it also produced a logic that divided the world and only eliminated the disease from one half. So we're seeing this logic play out in real time today. In countries ravaged by war and armed conflict, such as in Yemen, cholera and other disease epidemics are rife. In Yemen, for example, between 2018 and 2020, it was reported that over 1.2 million cases of cholera were recorded, with 1, over 1,500 associated deaths. So in your breakout groups, I'm going to ask the question, how does this tie in with Dr. Singh's article? Why are we going from talking about the persistence of cholera um, in India, for example, to talking about the arms trade and coronavirus? Theoretically, cholera should be both preventable and treatable. Science, medicine, and humanity have the means to prevent it, and in the case of outbreaks, to ensure it's tightly controlled and eradicated, and yet it persists. And this is where I believe Dr. Singh's piece ties in with an argument that I make in my blog post. The war in Yemen is often portrayed in the media by politicians, international agencies, and NGOs as a humanitarian crisis. Often we hear terms such as senseless used to describe acts of violence, such as bombings of hospitals or schools. However, as Dr. Singh states clearly, and again I quote, the persistence of cholera is more to do with political choices. And the humanitarian crisis that we're witnessing in Yemen, the consequence of five years of devastating war, is like the persistence of cholera in certain regions, a political choice. And this is where our Foreign Secretary's support for a global ceasefire and discussions around the UK's role in protecting global health falls short. Throughout the pandemic, weapons companies based in the UK, such as BAE Systems, have continued to export arms to countries like Saudi Arabia. Our government's words are not backed up by their actions. And this is a common theme. Countries in the West who've built large empires and maintain some power and influence over their ex-colonies and further continue to enact foreign policy and trade measures that actively harm global South countries' abilities to rebuild and protect themselves from possible epidemics and other such catastrophes. We cannot seek to eradicate or contain coronavirus while simultaneously waging wars and selling weapons to our trade partners. So I think in the second half, um, and this is what I thought to do with my reading. Um, I wanted to give the kind of context of the impacts of the arms trade on, um, on countries' abilities to respond to coronavirus um, with possible solutions, like looking into the future. Um, so the final two texts I have recommended that you read look more for the solutions to the political hypocrisy and dissonance that I mentioned before. Um, when it became clear that the UK was not adequately prepared for coronavirus because of the chronic underfunding and under-resourcing of the NHS, again, we see um, this issue of political choices that have been made. The government put a call out for industry to convert their manufacturing to much needed products such as ventilators and personal protective equipment, PPE. Hilary Wainwright's article, Swords into Plowshares, Planes into Ventilator Parts, argues that the COVID-19 crisis has made conversion a matter of urgent necessity. So when I talk about conversion, I mean the conversion of, of different industries, harmful industries, the conversion of their production to producing so-called socially useful products. She describes how a number of air travel and arms manufacturing companies responded often encouraged by trade unions and workers, and swiftly began the process of conversion. This includes companies such as Airbus, Rolls-Royce, and BAE Systems, 
companies that also contribute to environmental destruction and the fueling of wars. Wainwright describes the role of the Airbus Union branch in organizing the workers to push for conversion to respond to the call out in order to protect workers who otherwise would potentially face furlough, possible redundancy or a reduction in hours. In times of crisis and in the face of huge job losses, unions will mobilize to support their workers. But despite the short term project of converting jobs in industries whose production and income have been massively hit by coronavirus and the, the example that um, Wainwright talks about is the aviation industry, as I said before, huge job losses continue to be on the cards. Over a month ago, Airbus announced that over 1,000 workers were due to be made redundant and Rolls-Royce nearly 3,000. Wainwright writes, if pre-existing markets do not recover, the interests of the union and Airbus shareholders might diverge. The company can relocate its capital to its other activities, defense, space, or helicopters, even if that might involve layoffs at Brefton. Capital is mobile. And I think for me, this articulates the ultimate issue at play here and that coronavirus has really kind of exposed for everyone to see. The issue being that capitalism can protect capital at any cost and people's lives, livelihoods and lives are expendable in this pursuit. Whether it's workers in Wales, inadequate and insufficient PPE for our key workers or people's lives in Yemen, Gaza or Kashmir. What this makes clear, however, is that it's not enough to seek to convert production from unsustainable and harmful goods like weapons and airplane parts only in times of crisis or only when jobs are threatened. This is a long-term project that must have permanence and the struggle for a so-called just recovery from coronavirus and arms conversion and defense diversification must bring together different sectors of society in solidarity to be successful. So we need to see workers and their trade unions showing solidarity with the people of Yemen, with workers in Yemen, with, with ordinary people in Yemen um, to come together and fight for a more sustainable future. So as an Aboriginal artist and activist, Leela Watson so eloquently put it, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come here, if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And this is, I think, a really crucial point that we touch upon later as well in the other reading. Um, it's, as I say, it's not that we need to, you know, it's not that we need to just help the people of Yemen. It's that actually what's happening in Yemen also is, has negative impacts everywhere. You know, the arms industry, the aviation industry has negative impacts on a global scale. Um, and it has, and through its unsustainability, has a negative impact on workers in the UK. Um, so a great political and societal shift is needed in order to make a just transition that includes the eventual abolition of the arms trade possible. That centers collective health and well-being as well. So this is where the final reading, which is a discussion paper by the Amazon group on rethinking security from 2016, becomes really useful in my opinion. Um, so the Amadan group rightly identified that our current political and popular understanding of the concept of security is as follows. And again, I'm quoting from the reading. Official security discourse is concerned to varying degrees with two goals, a state's duty to protect its citizens and the desire to gain or preserve power relative to other states so as to improve our position in the world. They point out that the first goal privileges the needs of one society over the rest, the second one state over the rest. So I just want you to kind of think of that. I want you to think of that, um, that uh, quote when we move into our discussion, our discussion groups. So as is discussed in the paper, Britain and many other nations currently seek to achieve security through asserting and maintaining control and power, whether domestically or on an international scale. They do this through a myriad of means, which I'm sure many of you will be able to name off, to list off. Um, but for example, they do this through creating and enforcing borders, coercive and punitive policing measures, which you will have heard of last week, building up military and armed forces and maintaining a well-stocked arsenal of technologically advanced weaponry. However, it's very clear that these measures actually create insecurity, they bring insecurity, particularly to those deemed to be most expendable. 
Um, so just as an example, the work that those deemed to be ex expendable could be the working classes of the world, black and brown people, minority communities, poorer people in the global south, and really the list goes on. And actually it seems it makes clear like who does this concept of security that we currently politically enact and implement, who does it actually benefit? It's clearly a minority of people. As they go on to write, as the world becomes more fractured ecologically, economically, socially, and politically, such that debilitating, debilitating want and indignities multiply, so will threats of all kinds of all people. The hegemonically determined international order is likely to implode. So I thought that that quote in particular was very kind of um, prescient right now because coronavirus is just one of those threats. This pandemic that everyone you know, kind of talks about as unforeseeable, which in fact people for public health, um, public health specialists for years have been saying we're due a pandemic. Um, it, you know, this is just one of those threats that affects everyone. Um, so coronavirus is just one of those threats with nuclear war, armed conflict and climate catastrophe being some of the others. A secure world would work together as much as possible to protect people everywhere from health crises such as coronavirus and would ultimately be more effective and successful in preventing or containing disease outbreaks. A secure world would prioritize having strong public health and welfare systems in place to ensure that if and when an outbreak hits, it's well prepared. The Amardan group frames true security as security that is meaningful, durable and inclusive depends not on a list of liberal values, but on the principle of social and ecological health at every level from the local to the global. We currently have systems in place that create insecurity on a mass scale and prevent the achievement of true security or human security. I believe that the need to rethink security is a common thread through all the readings that I provided. And I hope that that kind of came out when you were reading some of them. And I wanted to end with the following sentence from the Amadan Group's paper in the hopes that it will be a good kind of catalyst to spark broader discussion. Security, so the quote is, security follows solidarity, not dominance, standing with others, not over them. And yeah, so I'll just pass over to Sayana now. Um, I hope that kind of clarified the readings that I recommended as well.